it all ties up to one question that relates to not just this panel, but this whole conference. What do you make of this? Yeah, we can, we can stand here and, and talk about whatever we are passionate about, but the key thing is what you make of it. I'm going to share with you a part of my life story um, that is very personal, but at the same time uh, is historical. Uh, and I framed it in, in terms of memories and remnants of what we once used to call the information superhighway. You now call it the internet. Um, uh, a little bit about me, because uh, I realize that perhaps, although I am well known locally, uh, I would not be as well known to this audience, of course. Um, I'm based in the UK. Uh, my office is right there on the right. This is Media City in the UK, where uh, a number of major organizations are based. I work for the University of Salford, and I run something called the Digital Curation Lab. And what this relates to, in part, is a history of the internet and histories of the internet and how we communicate those, not only in the present, but into the future. So we go back to the past. Here's a very younger me, this is about 25 years ago, when I was um, completing my PhD at New York University. Uh, you will see the Twin Towers in the background, so you can see that that's still very much the late 20th century there, rather than this horrid century we, we live in. Um, I don't know what was going through my head at that time, but I was very much immersed in this emerging information superhighway. And I originally went to write a PhD about yoga uh, for actor training. I ended up writing about the open web and the implications of legislation and commercialization to artists instead. And to me, the two are connected. They're connected in the sense of openness of about what do you make of this? How can this be meaningful to you? And this idea of the open web as utopia was very much in the, in the water at the time, as, uh, you know, to, to, to put it that way, in the sense that everybody believed that this was going to change the world or they thought it was just another fad. Yeah, there were, there were many people who thought the internet would go away or that you know, this was just the next slinky or something. I don't know if, if everybody knows what a slinky is, but never mind that. So the idea of the open web is the key part here because it's a very different um, media experience, if you will, in the 90s than it is that we are experiencing today. And this idea of utopia, yeah, this, this, this perfect idyllic society that we could live in, really started developing. Uh, we spoke about, see, this is some of the terminology that was branded about at the time, cyber utopianism, web utopianism, digital utopianism, um, utopian internet. And this was part of a larger discourse relating to technological utopia. But here we found a, a, a key elements that there was a, a, a move, if not a drive, towards decentralized, democratic, and libertarian societies. At least that's what the, the, the main narrative, if you will, was about. And the key terms that kept, showing, uh, that kept uh, turning up quite regularly in the 1990s were uh, privacy, anonymity, freedom of expression, information access. And these were desired values rather than values that perhaps you know, were ones uh, that, that, that we lived with on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so to go even back you know, further in time, how did we get there? How did we get to these ideas in the 1990s. And there's a cultural lineage that comes after World War II through a, a culture of youth, uh, if you will, uh, particularly in what we call the Western world, uh, really. And, and so there's a rise of a bohemian uh, way of life, uh, a counterculture, uh, this idea of anti-authoritarian, a neoliberal then as we get into, into the 80s, and then eventually this idea of techno-utopianism that leads into some of this other utopian stuff I was talking about. Look, I, I want to keep this simple, really, and, and simple in the sense that I'm sure that some of you have heard of Web 2.0, and sometimes we, they, they say it's now Web 3.0 or even Web 4.0. Well, Web 1.0 was all about open data, yeah? open data, that is to say, data that is accessible to everyone. Not all this data that these, that these big corporations have about you 
And in some cases, you don't even know what they have about you. So open data, net neutrality, yeah? That is to say, my signal going out to you isn't reflected in any way. There's no algorithm telling you whether you can get my message rather than someone else's message if my message is intended for you and you want it. And the so-called information uh, superhighway. But another key element, and uh, earlier Josh had this, had this model for, for the blockchain, uh, there, there's something in between uh, the two models that he showed, and it's this, this idea of peer-to-peer of, of -peer networks. Peer-to-peer -peer where, where we can con communicate directly with each other, with one another, but around the idea that information wants to be free. Yeah, so again, this was one of the slogans that was branded about quite frequently uh, in the 1990s. Uh, but also, information wants to be expensive. And so, uh, it, there was a tension, but there was a sense by the, well, by the utopianists, if you will, in the 90s, that this tension would go away. And this tension would go away by the two definitions of the word free. In English, the word free has two meanings. In most other languages, we have two words. Uh, free as in gratis, as in, you know, here's a free drink, here's a free beer, here's a free whatever. And the other one is, is free, free as a bird, or free, freedom of expression, that kind of freedom. So, so libre in this, in this sense. And here, we had all of it, if you will. You know, it was free because, well, I was sharing with you whatever I had, and you were sharing with me whatever you had, and we were doing it freely. Um, this bunch of uh, men, mostly white men, mostly Americans, uh, were the proponents and the critics, in large part, uh, of this idea of cyberspace, as it was primarily called back then, uh, as a utopia. But interestingly, you know, some will see what happened in the Arab Spring about 10 years ago as a consequence of this, the proponents of cyberspace as utopia. Whereas on the other hand, of course, the critics, some of them, were originally proponents even, and then came to realize that the web was being closed. And, uh, you know, I mean, I'm happy to engage with anyone on, on uh, these ideas as they happened historically. I don't know where I sit myself uh, necessarily at this time. But back then, I, I, I did buy into the idea of the possibility of, uh, of a utopia. I was young. You saw my picture. I mean, come on. You saw how much hair I had. Um, but seriously, um, what I'm really talking about is fragments and remains. Yeah? It's fragments and remains. Um, and to me, there are two specific fragments, two specific remains that have remained with me since then. And the first of these is podcasting. That to me comes from webcasting. So before there was podcasting, there was webcasting. This is a term you hardly hear anymore these days. Yeah? So most people, I would take it, have an idea at least what a podcast is, even if you haven't heard or watched one. But we were doing exactly the same thing that we do with podcasts now, back in the 90s, and calling it webcasts. Very few people heard us, very few people saw us, because you know, they had dial-ups, but there we were in 1998, 99, doing, doing webcasting. And my podcasting has led eventually to a series of podcasts. I'm now at 660 in the series of podcasts of Maltese music. Not even radio stations play Maltese music regularly, or at least as regularly as you can get it on this podcast. Uh, that's, the, that's the first iteration of it for the first 10 years or so. This started in 2005, and it's still going on now. Uh, well, you can see that's an older me, I hope. That's even five years ago now already. So, The other is, of course, wikis. This idea of open knowledge and open data. And this is where open knowledge and open data will reside in large part now. We heard about Wikipedia a couple of times, uh, but I thought Wikipedia would come up even more frequently. And this is where I, personally, have invested my time over the last 20 years. First as a volunteer, then as an employee. I worked for, as a disclaimer, I worked for the UK chapter of the Wikimedia Foundation in London for a couple of years, uh, about eight years ago. But now again as a volunteer on the Maltese language Wikipedia. So not assuming yeah, that English is the lingua franca and that, you know, I mean, well, Wikipedia is available in about 300 languages. So why not Maltese? And this is, this is a challenge in itself. But of course, Maltese is just the one language that I have picked, but I work very closely with others across the world, from, I don't know, from Ghana to, to Ukraine, even, if you will, and uh, all the way from, I don't know, Georgia to Uruguay. 
Um, these are people I, I converse with regularly because of Wikipedia. So, really, um, in, in the opening session, um, Everest Bartolo spoke about nostalgia. I think it's an imagined nostalgia. That, that I'm not big about nostalgia. I'm a historian. So, uh, for me, I know how ugly things were. So, I don't want to go back in time. You know, I know how horrid empires were. I don't want an empire again. You know, so for me, it's an imagined uh, nostalgia. It's an imagined nostalgia. Even this, this nostalgia of all these, of all these, you know, middle class white men who are who are be the proponents and the critics. You know, where are people of color? Where are where are be people of other genders other than these men? And this is this is something that we find in movements such as the Wikimedia movement, where proponents of Wikipedia will say, we need to address the gender gap as much as anything else, for example. So, utopia is impossible, I would say. You know, I mean, it, it, the idea of an imaginary community or an imaginary society, at least in Western culture, has come to us since the time of the Greeks. But how many countries do you know that use Plato's Republic as a blueprint? I don't know of any yet. But, and I doubt there will ever be one that does that. And the same can be said of, of uh, uh, Thomas More's you know, fictional island in the new world that he created in, in his book called Utopia. Equally, although I, I completely uh, recognize and appreciate and I, I, uh, I'm completely sensitized to the kind of stories we've heard on the panel today, dystopia is equally impossible. Yeah? And the reason for this is simple. This technology was originally designed to do away with central control and intermediary powers. I'll read that again. This technology was originally designed to do away with central control and intermediary powers. So back to square one. It's up to you. <laughs>